Now to the models and time-lapse pictures. Watch as the water moves out from an irrigation furrow. Note that the movement outward is almost as great as that downward. This is added evidence of water movement is mainly due not to gravitation, but to the attraction of solid surfaces. As the soil becomes wetter and wetter, however, gravitation plays a stronger role. And if the soil becomes completely saturated, then gravitational forces predominate. The horizontal layer you see is coarse sand. One of the important principles of unsaturated flow is described as you witness what happens as the wetting front encounters this layer of coarse sand. The pores in the soil are many times smaller than those between sand grains. Water is held in these small pores by large adhesive and cohesive forces. The pores in the soil are like the pores in a piece of blotting paper used to soak up ink. The huge pores in the sand cannot hold water at the tensions which exist in the wetted soil above. So the water does not move readily into the sand. However, as the soil above the sand becomes very wet, the water eventually moves into the sand just as ink would drip from a blotter which is wet excessively. The sand layer thus acts something like a check valve, holding the water back until the soil becomes very wet and then letting the excess pass through. What happens to water in soil containing a sand layer is typical in principle of what happens to water in field soils where sands and gravels occur as layers in finer soil material. A great deal of agricultural land is layered in this fashion. In Washington State's Columbia Basin, there exists a quarter of a million acres of soil composed of one to two feet of a fine sandy loam overlying coarse sands and gravels. The ability of this soil to support plant growth is greatly affected by the presence of coarse sands and gravel. Because of these coarse materials, the overlying soil can retain more than double the amount of water usually held in a fine sandy loam. This is one of the best soils in the Columbia Basin. Now in this sequence, you see a layer of fine clay in an otherwise uniform soil. This clay layer is similar to a clay pan or any type of layer in which the pores are extremely fine compared to the pores in the overlying soil. These layers often restrict rooting depths of plants and are particularly known for the trouble they cause in preventing downward penetration of water. When excess water is added to the soil, water tables are often built up over such layers. If they occur at shallow depths, water tables often rise above the land surface during wet seasons, imposing serious limitations on agricultural use. Despite the fact that a clay pan hinders downward movement of water, it does absorb water readily as the soil above is wetted. Observe the wetting front as it moves into the clay pan. The pores in the clay are much finer than those in the overlying soil, so they can pull water from the soil. Water tables are not built up over clay pans because of inability of water to enter them. Instead, water tables result from slow transmission of water. The resistance to water flow in the extremely fine pores of layers like these is sufficiently great that even over periods of weeks and months, little water is transmitted through them into the soil below. The pores in restrictive layers found in nature are quite variable. They range all the way from fine pores that allow almost no water to pass up to pores that are almost as large as those of the overlying soil. The extent to which downward flow is restricted and water storage is altered depends on the fineness of these pores and the thickness of the restricting layer. This is in contrast to what was shown earlier in soil overlying coarse sand layers. There, the downward movement of water was temporarily checked, but water tables could not be built up so long as the opportunity for free drainage into the coarse material